Um, this is our comprehensive talk on the adventures in the dark web of government data. Um, your speaker is going to be Mark DeCosta. He's the co-founder and chairman of Enigma, an open data infrastructure company. He's got a PhD in anthropology and writes about culture and technology. And without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Mark. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm certainly excited uh, to have the opportunity to, to share with you all uh, some of my, my adventures and, and real fascination and passion for uh, public data. Uh, so yes, I'm Mark. I'm from New York City originally. Uh, sometimes I go around the city with my laptop and uh, a large antenna and sort of tune in to uh, some of the, the fun things that can be overheard on the, uh, the radio spectrum around the city. Um, as mentioned, I do a lot of work with um, kind of public and uh, government data and the company Enigma that I started. Uh, we have a big sort of open source uh, search engine called Enigma Public of uh, all of this stuff that we, uh, we aggregate and bring together. Um, but I think probably to kick things off, it would be helpful to sort of get uh, some kind of clarity on, on terms and, you know, what, you know, what exactly is government data and uh, does it really have a dark web? Um, so. It's interesting. I think you know one of the easiest ways to think about like this more expanded idea of government data is that it's sort of the thing that's produced every time you come up against or hit regulation in some ways. Um, you know, the we, of course we have these you know sprawling bureaucracies uh, at you know federal, state, and local levels, and every time you you touch them, they have a way of of kind of kicking off some data exhaust. And from uh, sort of a reconnaissance and open source intelligence perspective, this can be really good. Um, one of the really kind of interesting maps, I think, at least at the U.S. federal level, to uh, what's going on from a data collection perspective uh, all came out of this thing from 1980 called the Paperwork Reduction Act. And basically what happened uh, in the 70s is there was just a massive proliferation of forms and, and sort of you know, government information collection instruments and all these things, and it, it rose to the level where the Congress passed a law. And what that law said was basically every time the federal government wants to make a new form, they have to uh, themselves fill out a form and uh, register it with the Office of, Ma uh, of Management and Budget, uh, which is part of the executive branch. And just to kind of show you here, you know, this is a kind of an ordinary uh, tax return 1040, um, and it has this OMB control number in it. And this is great. Anytime you have a federal, uh, U.S. federal government form, it will definitely definitely have an OMB number on it somewhere. And you know, when a government agency wants to make a new form, they've got to apply to the OMB. And one of the things they have to do is justify why they need the form and also estimate how, uh, you know, what are called sort of the burden hours of, uh, of the forms. So right now there's you know, maybe about 10,000 different unique forms that are registered with the federal government. And what I find extraordinarily remarkable is that according to the government's own estimates, uh, they require 11.3 billion hours uh, uh, each year of people's time to fill out. So we can certainly extrapolate that there's a lot of information being uh, produced here. Um, just to kind of flag this, if, if this is something that's kind of interesting to you guys and you want to explore further, this it's kind of hard to Google for, but it's called the Current Inventory Report. Uh, I made just a little bitly that'll drop you right into the the sort of proper uh, government site. And it is kind of fun because there, are, there is like an XML file that has all of this stuff structured in it and, uh, and you can go and, and play with it. And so, you know, just to kind of to flesh out like, you know, what is this real spectrum of information the government's producing? Uh, you know, if anyone's come into the country, uh, into the US from abroad, you've probably seen this form. It's one of the most filled out with over 300 million of them a year. Um, things like W 2, so the sort of um, you know tax form for your if you're on payroll somewhere, so a quarter billion of those uh, produced a year. I was sort of surprised to see that uh, these friction ridge cards or friction ridge cards, uh, actually there are about 90 million of them filled out every year. And I suppose it's not all strictly for people being arrested. This one uh, that I just found on Google Images is for someone applying to be a, a pyrotechnic. Uh, Operator, so I suppose these things are produced in lots of ways, and so those are you know some of the more common forms that are produced. But there also is a really long tail here. So everything from 
the 20 or 30 companies that actually fish off the Alaska coast near Russia and have a specific form they need to fill out to uh, the importation of shelled peas from Kenya, um, and things like the petroleum supply reporting system, which I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it does sound like it could be interesting and, and juicy in some ways. And so once you start to know that, oh, there is a form out there, they're of course not all public, but there's a really interesting tranche of them that are, you can start to go out and, and collect information. So just as an example, this is you know, what a federal election commission form looks like. And I don't know if you can see it, but this is like a line item by line item um, uh, sort of disbursement schedule for all of the things that the Trump administration uh, campaign spent money on, so we have $140 Uber credit there. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this data set uh, later, but the FCC licenses you know, all commercial radios in some way in the country, and you can use that data set to actually find every McDonald's drive through in the country and also what uh, frequencies it's uh, uh, linked to the restaurant with. Um, certainly, I'm sure you guys have been in elevators. You'll see these little inspection placards that's run at the state level, but that's sort of data that you can get and, and learn all about what's going on inside of a building. Um, you know, certainly uh, aircraft registrations are really interesting and have tail numbers and all sorts of interesting joins you can do with radios. Um, this, as an example, is just the deed for the hotel that we're in. Um, and when you take it a step further, it's kind of cool because you, uh, whenever there are building permit uh, applications filed for changes use in the space or renovation. There's often um, sort of architectural drawings and things like that. So this is also from the hotel. Um, the Department of Labor collects a lot of information on things like uh, um, uh, this is, I think, for the OSHA, so the Occupational Safety and Hazard uh, something. Uh, it's a little bit of a sad case of someone who fell down an elevator shaft here, but there's a lot of information produced. Um, you know, H-1B visas, I couldn't really show it very clearly here, but these are the 14 or 15 or whatever it is, H-1B visas that uh, Caesars applied for uh, in 2018, and you can see they're mostly uh, tech, you know, sort of tech programming looking people. Um, this I just kind of found and thought was kind of funny. It's the 401k plan that uh, DEF CON Communications has for the four people that are enrolled in it. Uh, and this is actually one of my all-time favorite uh, pieces. So this is a customs declaration from the 1960s that the uh, Apollo 11 mission had filed upon coming back with, with moon rocks. Uh, and so, you know, it just is kind of a, a lovely artifact of bureaucracy, I think, and, and does give us some sort of, you know, sense of, of the kinds of things that do appear uh, hidden away in the state. And, you know, I think the, the takeaway, you know, that I want to leave you guys with just from kind of having blown through all of that stuff is, you know, government bureaucracy can really be your friend. I think that there's, you know, certainly a, a key set of probably sources of government data that are in our toolkits, be they, you know, real estate records or corporate registrations or whatever. But this is a really deep and, and, and sort of massive well of, of resources. And by kind of thinking about, like, what are the processes and how does that potentially reflect in data, uh, you can start to develop um, all sorts of new avenues for uh, research and exploration. So, you know, I have a, a big personal interest sort of in software-defined radios and uh, the sort of uh, EM uh, uh, spectrum, and I was really curious to sort of see how the public data that's available around the usage of um, the electromagnetic spectrum could be used to, to sort of ask different questions of the world. Um, I'm sure this won't be really a surprise to anybody in this room, but of course, you know, radio waves are, are all around us. Uh, you know, they're sort of in that um, really cool sort of spectrum that takes us from all the visible light that we see around us to, you know, the uh, FM stations in our car and the Wi-Fi and all of these things are uh, just waves of, of different lengths. Um, you know, of course, uh, you know, Marconi is often credited as being one of the, uh, the uh, sort of inventors of radio. And it's kind of amazing. In its early days, it was, you know, it's not surprisingly like a terribly unregulated and, and quite sort of chaotic uh, um, technology that was, you know, people were just broadcasting, creating all sorts of interference. Um, and actually, a lot of the regulatory regimes now that we have in the U.S., um, are said to sort of come as a result of the sinking of the Titanic in part, because the Titanic being a new ship, um, you know, did have a radio operator on it and was sending out SOS messages, but 
uh, the, the kind of thought was that there was so much interference on the sort of land-based stations that a lot of those messages weren't received. And so that uh, led eventually in 1912 to the Congress passing uh, what was called the Radio Act, which became sort of the precursor uh, to setting up the sort of FCC uh, regulatory regime that we have today. Um, and so, what, you know, so we, of course, now live in a world where uh, there is a lot more uh, sort of attention regulation around uh, the radio spectrum. And that, that's actually really uh, cool and exciting when it comes to trying to understand, you know, how this spectrum is being used. So I'm just curious, show of hands, has anyone seen this uh, map before? Um, so it looks like about maybe 20% of people. Um, I'll keep coming back to this sort of throughout um, uh, the remainder of the talk because it's, I think, a really good sort of touchstone to understand uh, how, you know, how a lot of these things are existing next to each other. So if you see this, um, it's, I know, a little difficult to um, get with much detail on the screen, but it, it goes basically from uh, maybe 3 kilohertz all the way at the top to like 300 gigahertz um, all the way at the bottom. And each one of those little blocks is... Um, a uh, basically, you know, a sort of reserved set of uses that that bit of the spectrum can be uh, used for. So you can see here, um, you know, the FM radio band of, is, of course, like 88 megahertz to 108 megahertz, roughly, and that's sort of uh, blocked off there. But what's interesting is you can start to see that, like, these things exist, um, you know, next to and alongside, of course, other uses of the spectrum. So, uh, you know, further down in, like, the 150s, 160s, 60 megahertz uh, range is where uh, this thing called AIS, which is like a merit, like, like ship positioning data is transmitted. And then, you know, further down uh, in the sort of next block at, you know, 1090 megahertz or just about a gig, uh, that's where all of the sort of aircrafts uh, are broadcasting their ship positioning data or vessel uh, positioning data. And so um, I just call that out to show uh, how these uh, different you know, protocols and uses of the spectrum do have a kind of continuity to them. And of course, uh, you know, there's a ton of politics and money at stake here. And uh, you know, as we know recently, you know, as sort of analog television um, has, has all been shut down, that spectrum is getting sold off. And you know, just last year, you have $20 billion being spent um, you know, mostly by the big telco companies to get access to some of that stuff that was freed up. So, um, you know, needless to say, this is like a very kind of high stake, if somewhat obscure and invisible um, sort of place that data is produced. So in the US, you know, of course, the FCC is the main uh, regulatory body here. And they basically like collect a ton of different information and release it in two different ways. Uh, the first one, which has the most data, is this thing called the universal licensing system. And there's maybe 15 or 16 different kinds of um, licenses that wind up giving they uh, wind up giving out, and each one has uh, a lot of sort of detailed information associated with it. As part of like an open data initiative, the FCC has done some work to unify all of that into this database called the License View Database. So I think it's maybe like 100 columns um, that sort of are harmonized across all of these things. Um, what's nice is it collects in one place all of these different licenses, um, and it basically pops out in one CSV file. Um, this uh, is um, a bitly link to a, a GitHub repo I uh, made, which basically makes it relatively easy to, if you have um, a Postgres server running, uh, um, you can basically run this script and it'll uh, you know, download the most recent version of this database, uh, geocode it, geoindex it, and, and make it searchable for you. Um, and the cool thing is once you do that, you can actually start to use this data to ask really targeted and specific questions about your local um, uh, environment in a way. So this is, um, I just did a sort of search of a, a kilometer um, a radius around the Caesars Hotel here um, and said basically like for all the licenses that have been um, given out within a kilometer of here, who kind of has the most of them and, and what are the kind of rank ordered counts of like how the spectrum is being used. Um, so, you know, probably not super surprisingly, the top three are all like Nextel. So this is your sort of cell phone stuff. 
Um, but you know, then kind of digging in, it was like, sort of interesting for me to start to learn like where where am I and what's going on around here. So Perini Building Company is a legitimate construction uh, firm that has no ties with the mafia, but they have done a lot of um, the casino construction in Las Vegas, and you know certainly one of the biggest holders around here. And then sort of drilling down, we of course see a bunch of the casinos themselves are really big recipients of licenses. Um, I was kind of surprised to see uh, because they'll come up later later in the talk, but this firm Recon Robotics, which um, by their own tagline is the world leader in tactical micro robot and personal sensor systems, uh, has a good 32 licenses right in this part of Las Vegas. And that in fact puts them on par with DEF CON, who I was very impressed to see is, is quite fastidious about making sure that uh, the official FCC licenses are all sort of filled out. Um, and one other thing that I, I'll sort of call out here that's I think really important when um, to keep in mind when you're working with these sort of government data sets is that there can be often a lot of confusion and difficulty when it comes to um, uh, you know doing like entity uh, recognition and resolution and stuff. And so um, towards the bottom here we have PH. Uh, WLV LLC, which I saw and I said, what is that? Um, and in fact, it's the parent company that, you know, it's a Planet Hollywood Holdings that owns this casino and many others. Um, so then, you know, now that you can kind of start to identify what's going on around, uh, around you geographically, how can you start to use and apply that? Um, you know, of course, uh, it's been quite amazing to see in the last several years how cheap um, software-defined radios have gotten, how much that's really opened up. So for those of you who don't know, um, you know, for like literally 20 bucks, you can get, um, uh, you know, a, a little USB dongle that will let you tune in to pretty broad um, spectrum. I think these will go from like maybe 50 or 60 megahertz to just over uh, a gigahertz or something like this. Um, and they're really cool and, you know, very easy to just sort of get started with. Um, this is a program called uh, GQRX, which is just a really simple sort of tuner. So if you plug in one of these USBs and, you know, put in a frequency, uh, you can listen to whatever might be coming, uh, coming across it. And so what's kind of interesting is we can start to, you know, not only just look at like what is the sort of um, the clustering of radio licenses around us, but actually dig into them a bit more specifically. And what's really nice about these is you do get um, some very high resolution information about how um, organizations kind of operate and function. So this one is... Uh, for the Caesars Hotel, it's you know one of many that they have. But what was sort of interesting is you know the person who actually filled out this license, his name is Eric um, Dominguez, who is the VP of sort of facilities and engineering here. And what's also included is his phone number uh, and email address, and it is his direct line. Uh, I, I called him, so I, I do know that to be true. And so these things uh, you know kind of become interesting when you're trying to think about what are other ways of um, uh, you know, understanding a, a, a target or a place of interest and, and finding things that uh, uh, let you uh, have a lot of sort of base knowledge about what's going on. Um, if uh, anyone's interested, these are sort of a, a big tranche of um, the radio frequencies that the Caesars Palace itself has uh, uh, licenses for. There are other ones under other um, entities that didn't come up in my sort of first search, but they can be ferreted out. Um, and just to kind of remind us to keep all of this in context, um, you know, we can see sort of these Caesar Palace radios are in the, the 450 meg zone, but then just a little bit down the spectrum, we've got uh, the radio uh, uh, frequencies being used for um, uh, sort of the control infrastructure around the, the water system in Las Vegas. And so it's a very um, uh, rich and crowded sort of space. Um, you know, but of course, this isn't uh, uh, only limited to these sorts of things. So. There's, uh, um, you know, NOAA 19 is a, a weather satellite that's, that's flying around above head. Um, it all operates in sort of the 137 megahertz range. And uh, a friend of mine actually in New York built uh, an antenna and a GCAL reminder so that whenever this um, weather satellite is actually over uh, the eastern seaboard, he can bring this thing outside and uh, actually download the images because, of course, you know, satellites, uh, these are kind of coming down unencrypted and uh, are there for um, gathering. And that's the URL for it if anyone's interested. Um, but I was, I was also kind of very curious to see in what ways um, uh, 
different kinds of public data could start to get joined with um, what we know on, is available on the radio uh, spectrum in order to, to do things like maybe look inside of a cargo ship. So of course today, um, ships are you know, really diverse radio stations in and of themselves. You can see here, um, you, know, you of course have GPS antennas and maybe satellite TV. Um, uh, you know, PAM radio antennas. But importantly, up here on the, the top left uh, is an AIS uh, antenna. And AIS stands for uh, Automated Identification System. And it's basically a, a radio protocol that um, is used for navigation and safety. And whenever a ship is underway, it um, broadcasts uh, some information encoded uh, on this channel. And it all um, basically lives around uh, I guess 161, 162 megahertz. There's two different channels that it goes on. And what's um, interesting is if you are, uh, you know, have a line of sight or have um, a decent antenna, you can actually, using one of these $20 dongles as an example, receive uh, those AIS messages that the ship is sending off. Um, and so uh, here you can kind of see in this. Um, uh, like text box or whatever. Those are what sort of the raw um, demodulated uh, packets sort of look like. And what um, you can basically do, it's because there's a, you know, peep, uh, there's a great uh, Python library called libAIS, and there's many other ones where people have sort of taken the spec and uh, made all the decoding. But basically, what data you're getting when you're listening to these ships um, basically breaks down to you know, what you're seeing here. And this tells you things like um, you know, the position and heading and rate of turn and things like that. But importantly, it also has this thing called an MMSI. And the MMSI is a, uh, it stands for Mobile Maritime Subscriber Identifier. It's basically like the cell phone number of the ship. And you can use that to then join with um, a second order piece of uh, government data. Here I, I wrote an API uh, that is all linked in that uh, uh, repo that I showed earlier. Um, but to connect to the um, International Telecommunication Union to take that uh, MMSI identifier of the ship and turn it basically into uh, the vessel name and some other information about um, uh, the ship itself. And once you have those two pieces, you can then get to the place where you can actually look inside of a ship. Um, and the way that you do that, the sort of conceit here, is uh, by taking um, uh, bills of lading data that often get filed before a ship hits the port uh, that explain basically for the purposes of customs taxation everything that's inside of the ship. Um, that data is kind of made available in a, in a very crazy way. So it's the only way that anyone can get access to it is by going to the Customs and Border Protection Office in Washington, D.C., giving them a $100 certified check and getting a CD in return. Um, but uh, through uh, Enigma Public, we actually gather all of that data and it's free with an API on it. Uh, and so he's able to sort of stack all of these things together. Um, I'm just on time. Okay, so um, this is sort of uh, you know one example. Um, another one I'll just quickly talk about is using ADSB uh, uh, sort of data, which is very similar to AIS, but it's for aircraft. Um, and there's a really interesting piece of work that was done by BuzzFeed, uh, specifically around looking for the extent to which uh, governments were using Stingray devices, um, which uh, you know, often are put in uh, aircraft and flown in circles, uh, you know, when they're going after a target. Uh, and stingrays, of course, are, are ways to, uh, you know, track and intercept uh, some, uh, very specific cell phones. Uh, and so basically what they did that was really smart is um, we're able to take all of the um, uh, sort of like, fl like ADSB flight data, and there's companies like FlightAware and others that aggregate it for the whole U.S., um, and they applied some uh, you know, basic kind of analytics to it to look for all of the flight patterns over cities where uh, planes were just kind of flying in circles a lot. Um, and based on that, they were able to identify all of these, um, you know, both airplanes that were like very clearly registered to Homeland Security or to a police department, but also in addition, all of these new companies that uh, were shell companies being used by the government, um, but that they were able to kind of back into once they knew that those companies were potentially of interest because of these unusual flight patterns. Um, you know, there is, uh, you know, I think when we think about all of the different radio devices that surround us all the time, there are a lot of different um, opportunities and examples of 
taking this sort of contextual public data and applying them uh, to, uh, to those devices. Um, and just kind of in closing, since we're, we're coming up on time, um, I want to tell you about sort of another investigation that I did here around trying to understand the surveillance infrastructure along the U.S.-Mexico border. So what you're looking at here is just kind of a slightly interpolated map of all the radio licenses that are within 10 kilometers of the U.S.-Mexico border. And when I was looking at them, you know, the, you sort of see these normal um, dispersion patterns around cities, of course, like the radio towers and uses are all over the place. Um, but what I was kind of very interested in is sort of seeing out um, in sort of some of these more remote um, uh, sort of desert frontier places, um, these very regularly spaced towers that uh, were being put up along the border. Um, and the, you know, this one in particular is, uh, was put up by a company called IMSAR. And so I started looking, I said, well, what does IMSAR do? Well, they make, you know, the kind of the radar packages that go, the ground radar packages that go on uh, predator drones and other things like that. So I thought, well, this could be interesting to try to dig in and, and get a sense of who, who and what else is sort of happening along the border. So this is um, just kind of like a, a count of like who are all of these kind of entities that uh, are showing up doing experimental work specifically along the border. Um, I just called out that company Recon Robotics, which was uh, the one I had mentioned earlier, is also doing a lot of work uh, around this hotel. Um, but then I sort of went through and actually wanted to look at all these companies um, and basically, you know, found, and I suppose it's not so surprising, but that in fact uh, the vast majority of them are uh, defense contractors of different stripes. And so sort of starting to go through and, and looking at like, you know, who are these companies and, and what are they doing, um, uh, you sort of, you know, stumbled upon all this really kind of uh, fascinating technology, I suppose, in a way. So TCOM makes these aerostatic blimps that um, you know, uses surveillance platforms. Um, Leonardo DRS is a uh, uh, Italian defense contractor, but they you know, purport to have the most widely used ground surveillance radar. Um, and you, you sort of see a lot of these interesting packages. Um, e ELTA is an Israeli defense company that does a lot of um, border security work that's also sort of working there, um, as is as Elbit Systems. Um, and so, you know, what's really interesting is, you know, you can again pivot from these very specific licenses or these sort of aggregates of licenses to then go and look at like where are the sites and where are these sorts of things happening. So it's, you know, kind of incredible uh, for me to just then actually be able to go, um, go over to Google Maps, punch these things up, and start to see all of the sort of sites where these uh, bits of exploration and, and sort of prototyping this like virtual <laughs> fence uh, are starting to happen. Um, just as a like last piece of context there, there was um, a bunch of these were part of an older program uh, that Boeing uh, had, was sort of wound up being a massive disaster. They were supposed to be able to cover the entire border for seven billion dollars, but wound up spending a billion dollars to only do 50 miles, and the thing didn't even work. But um, you know, the thing that I'll sort of leave you with, and hopefully, uh, kind of came across in the talk, and sort of through these examples and context of like what's possible with data more generally, is to really think about you know not only where these deeper, uh, perhaps um, unseen bits of data are, but really thinking about how they can be put together to tell sort of broader stories. So, anyway, thank you very much. No time for questions.